all his life, plain and simple. You know, ask any baller. If, if you know, you know. The game has changed, but it's still the same. If you want it, go get it. Shazam! The inbounds pass comes into Jordan. Here's Michael at the foul line, the shot on Elo. Ah, the Bulls win! They win it! Mike, you're honestly telling me that you're top five. Yeah. Top five of all time. No question about it. Booker, this is for the win. Got it. Wow. The ruling on the floor is made basket. You know, one thing's for sure. Over at Valley Sports Plug, you're never going to catch us slipping. First overall pick, the Phoenix Suns select. Three, two, one, yeah! Welcome to Pass the Outlet, episode 18. I'm your co-host, Michael Benjamin, joined as always by my wingman, Chris Patrick. Chris, how are you feeling tonight, man? You know, Mike, I've been better. I can't lie. I think uh, we all know what happened last night. It's just been a rough 24 hours for Suns fans in particular and for Valley fans in general. There's just a whole lot going on. So I'm excited to get into that and uh, some other basketball-related topics, maybe get my mind off the Suns a little bit. Oof. Yeah. Excited to bring some other basketball topics because I was there in Footprint Center for Quote unquote fan appreciation night last night against the Clippers. I did not feel appreciated whatsoever. (laughs) And the state of Arizona as a whole, man, obviously, not just in sports. We got some crazy things going on in the Valley right now, but we're here to talk about the game we love, the beautiful game of basketball. We appreciate everybody who's joining us, watching back on playback or listening on podcast streaming services. Make sure you're following us at AZ underscore VSP. Leave a like, subscribe. Do all that good stuff. We appreciate you guys for joining us today. But with that being said, we got to start off from this past weekend. The men's final four was here in Glendale, Arizona at State Farm Stadium. Some heavyweight matchups. And then obviously we had our women's national championship game. Just the women's game has never been in a better state right now. It's awesome to see. And they were breaking records with over 18 million fans watching that national championship game but chris i'd be remiss if we didn't kind of go back and see what happened during those games and get your thoughts right off the bat so as we know the women's national championship game was on april 7th at rocket mortgage field house in cleveland ohio south carolina just an absolute juggernaut for the past couple of years coach don staley has made it an absolute powerhouse university for basketball and they take this one against freaking college phenomenon, I guess we could say, Caitlin Clark, um, as South Carolina wins 87 to 75 behind Camilla Cardoza's 17 or 15 points and 17 rebounds, six seven. She is just a monster. But the tale of that game, Chris, to start, it was the Hawkeyes, right? They started off that game 10 and 0. Caitlin Clark scored 18 points in that first quarter but then south carolina really just got into their rhythm and they played an overall team game they are the best defensive team in women's college basketball and it showed and they got huge contributions from some youngins from some youngins tessa johnson with 19 points off the bench the freshman just absolutely stellar but chris i gotta know did you watch any of the game how are you feeling about the women's game and man what a great place to be for women's basketball as a whole right oh without a doubt i mean a lot more attention i think on the women's championship this year than the men's and it's crazy just the contrast to the two to see just they were both kind of blowouts and to speak on the women's game first it was clear that south carolina was in control and caitlin clark couldn't do it all on her own of course she did end up with 30 points but that was on what was it uh 10 of 28 shooting it was clear that the the South Carolina Gamecocks were just a much deeper team, a much more well-rounded team. Obviously, there's no denying how good Caitlin Clark is, but when you're able to put it together defensively, have a game plan going in and execute, not to mention them going undefeated, a full undefeated season and winning a championship, that's a special story. 
it's it's really good for the game of basketball, honestly, to see the women's game getting this much attention, having this much fun and fanfare going on around it. I think it only bodes well for the future and and what to expect going forward. But that game in particular, it was it was a good one. It was a great one, man. It just kind of caught me off guard that it was so early here on the West Coast, right? It was a 12 p.m. start, um, but didn't miss a second, man. Had to watch that juggernaut matchup to see if South Carolina could pull off the undefeated season, which they did, and see Caitlin Clark's last game as a college athlete, man. It was a lot of fun, but it, yeah, it, you could just see the Gamecocks are built out as a whole team. They go nine deep. They get contributions from everybody. Where you look at the Hawkeyes, I mean, three of their five starters played 40 minutes. So they played the entire game. They get zero points off the bench. You can only do so much if you're Caitlin Clark. But what a run for her, and we're excited to see what happens moving forward with that. But got to look at the men's game, which was here in Glendale on April 8th. Connecticut Huskies back-to-back, 75-60 to over the Purdue Boilermakers. Another back-to-back uh, most outstanding player for Tristan Newton as well as he had 20 points, five rebounds, and seven assists. It's kind of it's kind of funny. It's the same thing like Caitlin Clark. Uh, Zach Eady can only do so much, right? 37, 10, and two blocks. Not getting contributions from his other teammates. Only two points from the bench. And Purdue struggled from outside from that UConn defense, only shooting one of seven. But Chris... What are your thoughts from this national championship game? And I don't know, was it kind of a snooze fest, man? Yeah, honestly, uh, uh, pretty shortly after the second half started, I think we all knew how this one was going to end. And I mean, I I echo your sentiment exactly. Josh Eady just, he, or I'm sorry, Zach Eady just couldn't do it alone. Obviously, that stat line: 37 points, 10 rebounds, two blocks is impressive. 15 to 25 shooting, but can't do it by yourself, man. I mean, you can play all 39 minutes, but it's a team game. The UConn Huskies, again, similar to the Gamecocks, just a much more well-rounded team, came in with a game plan and executed. It was it was kind of crazy. I mean, I guess not unprecedented, but to see two number one seeds in the championship matchup, you expected it to be a much better game. I mean, at least I did. And honestly, yeah, Snooze Fest perfectly sums it up. I did see, it was funny, we, we, we again, the contrast where we talk about the women's match starting at 12 our time 3 p 3 o'clock eastern i saw a lot of people online complaining about the men's championship game starting at 6 20 because what would that be like 9 20 on the east coast and it's like oh boohoo oh you can say oh 60 of the u.s lives on the east coast well it doesn't make any sense for the men's national championship game to start at 3 20 local time i mean just like i don't think in my opinion it didn't make sense for the women's game to start even at three o'clock eastern time i just I don't understand that. Like, I, I guess it probably comes down to a television rights thing, but I honestly think they they might reconsider that at least for the women's side in the future of maybe moving that back a little bit, get some more eyes on it. It's impressive that even in that time slot that they got that many eyes on it to start with. I'm sure in this day of streaming and playback, there are some people that caught it a little later, watched it back. But as far as the men's game go, man, yeah, I, it's just I I tend I, I went back to talking about the women's game there because what is there to really talk about about the men's game? I mean, kind of boring, man. Kind of boring. Well, and it's it it's almost kind of like it was a foregone conclusion, man. The UConn just built themselves over this two year run into just the cream of the crop. To be honest with you, all of their guys fit their roles and work tremendously i mean obviously we talk about tristan newton as the back-to-back -back most outstanding player he knows how to play in big games and steps up to the plate but then you have you know their big guys like donovan Klingon. like he plays his role he rolls to the basket he finishes strong just on eight shots too you know hassan diara coming off the bench dropping in nine points Stephen Castle doing his thing. Like this team is so built out and their defensive pressure is just crazy. It's like a, a, a match, you know, between the men's and women's game as a team whole. And the team that was built out the best in both respective leagues won the game comparative to just the superstars that were able to put their teams on their back to get them to that spot. Right. But at the end of the day, it is a team game and the best teams won, but yeah, I guess to to kind of talk about the time frames too. The game was here in Arizona. They're not going to play it at three o'clock for the East Coast people. The people are working, like ridiculous. Straight I, up. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you, man.
But hey, it is what it is. Uh, we'll see how the women's game specifically starts to transition over the next couple of years for college basketball, Chris, because, you know, who's next up? Who's going to be that next Caitlin Clark? I think is on a lot of people's minds. Who's really going to grasp people's just attention span and say, hey, I got to make sure I'm paying attention to what this player is doing. And I know that there's a lot of young women who are great players, specifically just thinking about Juju Watkins from USC. So the women's game is just in a great place overall right now. So props to South Carolina and UConn for getting those national championships. But Chris, it's back to our bread and butter. We got to talk about the National Basketball Association and unfortunately the Phoenix Suns. Chris, it has been an absolute tumultuous 24 hour span for the Phoenix Suns and the fandom for the Phoenix Suns. We're going to get into it. I know a lot of people, if you're tapped into this market, already know what I'm talking about. But I got to go back to last night, fan appreciation night. It was an absolute bloodbath, Chris. You can see from this photo that I took right here at one point, it was 51 to 16 with eight minutes left in the second quarter. I think they were on watch for the least amount of points to ever be scored in a first quarter, which was at seven because it was 35 to four at one point. And then finally, Devin Booker went to the line and just got, uh, it was like, ha ha claps, like excitement when he made those free <laughs> throws because we hadn't scored in so long, but it was just absolutely downright bad. And Chris, before we dive into the numbers, I just got to get your thoughts on what you saw from last night. Man, uh, to say it was ugly just doesn't even begin to describe what we witnessed last night. And I'm so sorry, Mike, that you had to be there in person to witness that firsthand. It, you, you saw it. I mean, you could hear it on the broadcast, the booze pouring in, the dejected fans. It's just crazy, like a team that we have such high expectations for. And, I, and to say it's a roller coaster would be an understatement. This season has not been at all what we expected. And to come out like that when we're trying to make a push to get a – that at least that six seed in the playoffs. Now it looks like obviously probably going to write us into the play in and, and the implications of that. I think I, I was also disappointed. And I mean, I'm not to get ahead of myself here. I'm sure we'll talk about it, but in the post game, it didn't seem like our guys were all that worried about it. The mentality was mostly like, Oh, you know, bad night on to the next. And it's like, no, you guys should be like, that's not what the fans want to hear. Like, well, I, I understand that might be the case, but this was not good. You have to own it. And, I mean, when you talk about superstars, man, KD, 8 of 22, Devin Booker, 1 of 11. So what is that, 9 of 33 combined? That is just absolute trash. I mean, I get that we we need to have our superstars shooting. And again, you're going to have a cold night every once in a while. But man, it was, it was hard to watch. It, it, it really made me want to turn it off. And I, I'm honestly not going to lie. I was in and out of this game because I turned it on, saw the score, and I said, nope. Waited a little bit. I was like, all right, well, I got to see. I got to see what happens here, especially as we were texting throughout the game. It's pretty impressive that they were able to fight back. I think they got within seven in the fourth quarter with about six minutes left, but weren't able to close the gap all the way. And I guess silver lining outside of the first quarter, we really didn't get beat up too bad the rest of the way through. They were able to, to kind of find their footing eventually. But th that's been a, a consistent story with this team, man, is the slow starts getting us in a hole. And there have been a couple times throughout this season where we're able to battle back. But last night wasn't one of those times. And it is just it is really hard to stomach. Uh, there's just some glaring weaknesses that continue to just fly across our TV screens at this point now. I mean, Yusuf Nurkic not being in the lineup, you can see it from the rebounds, just absolutely dominated 63 to 38. I mean, the only reason we kind of stayed within this game too was getting to the free throw line, but this team is starting to live and die by the three. And when you shoot 22.9%, you lose games. And when your he heavy hitter three-point shooters – and Eric Gordon, Royce O'Neal, and Grayson Allen shoot five of 23, you lose games, especially when your big three aren't able to step up to the plate. In must-win situations, Chris, like this is what it's becoming. I know teams probably don't see it that way, but we just know where this team sits right now, and 
just absolutely cannot put faith into this team in a one game scenario to be obviously honest with yourself saying, I trust that this Phoenix Suns team can go and win in the play-in game. Like it's every given night. You don't know what you're getting ever from this team. You know, at some points you go on a nice little stretch, you're seven and three, you get some big wins, you know, in new Orleans against the Cavaliers have a great defensive performance against Minnesota and then you just lay an egg and fall flat in fourth quarters again. And then you just uh, flat out just don't show up. Like, this team needs the sixth spot to just have some assurance within themselves saying, okay, you know what? It's been a struggle all season. We've been on the roller coaster. We know that. But now we're in a position to get some extra days off and go in super focused on this matchup. And you don't have to have – home court advantage for that. At least you know it's going to be a seven-game series. So we're going to have some great, great dialogue on our next on our <laughs> podcast. I can't wait. We're going to be, you know, recording that this weekend alongside UFC 300. But, man, like, we're going to get into the tape here in a second. But I got to ask you, Chris, a lot of the rumblings – Based off of the comments that were coming out of the game last night, you know, D book saying we're chilling um, Frank Vogel's, you know, inability to talk about what communication he really was given to his team off of a loss like this. My question to you is, is where's the leadership with this team right now? Who is the leader if there is one and how can this be rectified before the playoffs begin, which is now three games from now. Mike, that, that is a great question. And to be honest with you, I I am trying to be a realist while also maintaining my fandom. I don't think it is possible, man. We're this far into the season. It's not going to happen. And it's funny because you hear the national pundits, like Charles Barkley specifically, point has been pointing that out for months at this point, saying that the Suns don't have a leader. And KD and Booker can complain about it and act like that's not the case but there has to be a certain level of accountability like going back to what i'm talking about exactly like you said booker saying we're chilling while that might be true and you, you're trying to maybe ease some concerns like that's not going to get it done that's not what fans want to hear i think what's also getting buried in this loss particularly is the fact that they didn't have Kawhi leonard or james harden last night yeah, they still had Russell Westbrook, who is a shell of himself, and Paul George. Again, you can say what you will about playoff P, but he was showing out. He was drilling threes early and often. Uh, I, I have, I think the confidence for this team in the Valley. Is I think Chris was going to say right now, the confidence in this team in the Valley is just waning at the moment, right, Chris? The confidence is just waning right now. Go ahead, man. No, that's absolutely right. I apologize. I got a new computer, hit some button on my mouse and it booted me out. But yeah, I, I, I'm trying to get back on track here. But I, it's just crazy to me that we could just absolutely not show up for a game. Like you said, it's crunch time where there's only there's not that many games left in the season. What, four games or something like that? Like they're running out of time. And just to go back to answer your question and double down on it, I don't. I think we're out of time. And it's it's tough to see that when there were those high expectations and I'll continue to say that because I mean those these expectations for this team were high and at times it seemed like we we were them you know we were that team but right now I, I guess I guess it, it, it I, I guess I will say maybe not maybe tinfoil hat of me but is there a possibility I mean Mike to kick it back a question to you maybe is there a possibility that the Suns just are all that worried about the regular season and that once the playoff starts they're going to kick it into another year it sounds like it based off the comments, especially from Devin Booker as well, right? He's saying most people don't care about, you know, what's going to happen until the playoffs. And, you know, pinch me as a Suns fan to be in this position for the, this Phoenix Suns team to be good enough, at least for the past three years, to basically know that you should be in the playoffs every season. Like, we didn't have a decade of that, right? That's So it's it's cool to be in that position, but it's also a little bit dissatisfying to hear as a fan when you know that Devin Booker himself has been a person who the first six, seven seasons of his career never sniffed the playoffs because they were absolute dog shit. So to have that kind of mentality to go throughout any kind of season is just the wrong way to look at things. And 
you are putting the wrong foot forward, right? What creates the best kind of camaraderie and efficiency within a team is doing the right things every single night, right? It's easier said than done. I get that. But man, after you have a great stretch over these last, you know, 15 games, you could say, you almost have to put it as um, almost like, man, your goal is to have a certain kind of record, right? It, it, it shouldn't even be like where we want to finish up seating, right? It should be like, okay, over these last 15 games, we want to go 12 and three. So if we lose a tough one to the New Orleans Pelicans, we damn sure better not these lose these back-to-backs against the Clippers. Or, you know, when we go to Sacramento, we got to put the hammer down. Uh, but I'm just going in a circle here with my own thoughts and processes, Chris, because this team has my mind in a fucking pretzel. Like, I don't know where they're at at all in their own thought process when it comes down to what they have to do correctly and the changes they have to make moving into these playoffs. And it has, like you said, it has the Valley in a tumultuous state for the, for where this team sits going into the playoffs with only three games left. There is just not a lot of hope or faith that I have in this team right now because they haven't done anything consistently this entire season to give that to me. And they shouldn't have it for themselves, right? No, no, they shouldn't. And that's a really great point. I mean, I talk about how high my expectations are, and I think I can speak for all fans in saying that we did have high expectations, but what were this team's expectations for themselves? Like, again, going back to my potential hope, I guess maybe my hopeful theory, what I'm wishing for is they're like, hey, as long as we're in the playoffs, we don't really care what our seating is. We're going to show up 100% when the playoffs hit. Now, I don't think they would ever communicate that if that was their plan. But what were their milestones? Like you said, take a look at the last 15 games. Look at where you're at in the standings. Think about the type of team you want to be and what type of game plan you want to have going in there. I think going backwards a little bit, I mean, we look at the season where we broke our franchise record for wins and then fizzled out in the playoffs. And that was tough. We ran out of energy. We were, we were so focused on winning games that we couldn't get it done. So then the next season, kind of a more laxed approach. And then again, regardless, injury still caught up with us. That aside, I think there's got to be a little credence to wonder, did we take Chris Paul for granted? When we talk about leadership on this team and not having a veteran leader, it's I know Ian, big uh, New York, I'm sorry, Brooklyn Nets fan, he would tell us, you know, KD looks really disinterested sometimes. And going back to his Brooklyn days, like it's a burden for him to be the best player on the team. Maybe he doesn't want to be that leader. And I've seen qualities of it. You know, he'll grab guys and huddle them up. He'll he'll talk in guys' ears. He'll game plan. But like, is it going far enough? Is he doing enough? And does he want to do it? And almost same with Devin Booker, where it's like, I think leadership is more than just what you're saying to the guys. It's how you play on the court too and setting an example and watching Booker make lazy turnover after lazy turnover. It just seems so uncharacteristic, man. Like, what are you doing? I'm not saying Chris Paul never had a turnover, but he was on guys and rode DeAndre Ayton out of town. And we can talk about if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but now they're both gone and it seems like there's no leader on this team. And that's a real, real bad position to be in, let alone, to where your coach doesn't really seem to have much of a handle on what's going on either. Chris, you made some incredible comments and my favorite one that stuck out is going to lead us right into the outlet point guard. And it's sometimes it's not just about what you say, but it's what you do. It's your perception of how you put yourself out there on the floor. Now, like we know this guys aren't going to be able to shoot 13 of 17 every night you know, you're not going to be able to make all the right decisions on the floor, especially if you're one of those high caliber guys who plays 40 minutes a night. You're going to make mistakes on the basketball court. But it's how do you step back? How do you adjust? How do you come back out and have the proper energy to back up what you're saying? And unfortunately, I know Isaiah Thomas was talking about how Devin Booker has been the most vocal in the locker room. You know, probably since his time frame over the past two weeks that he's been on this team. But Chris, holy shit, man, last night, literally right off the rip, no energy. And you could almost see it from Devin Booker himself. Yeah. Am I there? Am I there? Yeah, yeah, you're here. I think you might be trying to pull up the, the clip right now. 
Uh, you're a little frozen, but I can still hear you at least for the time being. But it, I mean, just to talk on that real quick, I mean, it's it's great that Isaiah Thomas is saying that Devin Booker is being vocal and he's talking the talk, but you got to be able to walk the walk too. And when you can't do that, it, it it has a ripple effect through the entire team where these guys, man, they're looking for someone. I mean, you you when you're a role player like a Grayson Allen or a Royce O'Neal, you look at your superstar players for some sense of guidance and direction throughout the course of the game. And so, yeah, Devin Booker might be saying all the right things, and that's great, but he needs to walk the walk as well. And it, it just – and a lot of a lot of times, more often than not, recently it doesn't look like he's been able to do that. I don't know, man. It's it's really frustrating to see, and hopefully we can get these outlet point guard clips up because I really want to see the package you put together here, uh, guys. Looks like Mike might be having a little trouble right now, so I'll try and fill some space here. Um, but it, it's crazy. You see, you see the discourse online. I'm, I'm pretty frequently perusing the the Sun subreddit as well as. Twitter or X, Twix, whatever you want to call it. And it seems like the, that there's a strong sentiment. I don't see a lot of people disagreeing that this team just simply is not heading in the right direction. Whereas when you look at others, other teams in similar situations, it's kind of, oh, uh, let's let's kind of hope and pray that things get better when when they might, or not necessarily hope and pray, but maybe that we should have more faith. And I just think at this point in the season, asking fans to have more faith isn't isn't necessarily the answer. Uh, I mean, uh, asking this team to just kind of go along with the motions of what we've been seeing this entire season, you know, being the absolute worst fourth quarter team. Uh, it was funny. I was watching that Cleveland game and they put up kind of a stat of the worst differential teams in the fourth quarter right it was like the spurs at minus 75 the hornets at minus 85 and the suns were minus 222 or 224 so it's literally like every time that the a game goes into the fourth quarter this season you could pencil it in that they were going to get outscored and that they were going to have a fall apart like how am i supposed to just be holding hands with these guys and singing kumbaya and saying yeah they're gonna turn it on in the in the playoffs i mean we're at 82 plus games or we're coming up on 82 games here right and this big three has been playing together for a while now too chris so you can't use any of those kind of excuses for okay well how come guys aren't fitting within their roles or this isn't going the right way and whatnot but Man, we're we're I'm with you, man. We're out of time. You know me. I love to be the optimist. I the, the, I hang my hat on that kind of stuff. But sometimes you just got to be a realist. Unfortunately, this isn't the the season that this Phoenix Suns team is going to pull it together. And if they do, I mean, awesome, great. I'll be once again one of those same guys that'll put my hand up and say I was wrong, and I hope they prove me wrong. But they're just not giving me absolutely any confidence with the consistency of play that has happened over the last two months, the Jacqueline and Hyde kind of shit that continues to happen. I, 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 the, my last point too, Chris, is that big thing is playing down to competition, knowing that these big names are out and just absolutely falling on their, fla their face, like going to Milwaukee and getting just outshot of the gym, the, dropping an absolutely unacceptable game to San Antonio with Victor Wembanyama out. And then the Clippers not having their two best players. Like, I, I'm saying it. Paul George is number three for the Clippers. So yeah. th to come out that flat in situations where it's time to go, it's concerning, man. It's concerning. But before I pull up these clips, yeah, Chris, I'll pass it over to you one last time. Yeah, I was going to say, I just want to piggyback off that real quick, because I, I totally think you're 100% on point there. I mean, we talk about the confidence of the fans, but the confidence of the players on our team as well, and how much, you know, again, how much they look up to these superstar players. You mentioned we we lost to San Antonio without Victor Wembanyama. We also lost to Oklahoma City without Shea Gilgis-Alexander. Those teams that are playing at a high level right now are confident that when their star players are out, they're still going to be able to compete and be competitive in games, whereas... I don't know about you, but I certainly don't feel that way if Booker or Durant or at this point, shit, even if Beal is out, that we are not as good 
And I mean, obviously a team without their superstar is, is not as good, but to not have any confidence to be able to go out there, it seems like not only the fans, but it almost the outward perception is that our team doesn't think that we're able to win games without the superstars either. Yeah. And man, this is just the absolute tough <laughs> position to be at this far within a season. But um, so the, the video file that I had, unfortunately is corrupted. So I'm just going to pull it up the old fashioned way on YouTube. Um, so if some ads pop up, you know, don't kill us. I don't have YouTube premium, wherever the hell it is. But I mean, <laughs> just right off the bat here, Chris, this action play with the rub screen from Grayson Allen to Devin Booker. How is he not seeing Russell Westbrook literally right there? Like on his hip. Like, yeah, Westbrook didn't have to go anywhere to, to, to pick go anywhere. that up. But this is ba this so before I tried to pull it up and, and I got booted out a little bit when I was talking about how you said your actions got to kind of speak louder than your words here. Devin Booker makes this pass and then it kind of seems like he half jogs. Like, I don't know, did he pull his groin there? Like, he didn't, God. it doesn't even look like he's going back to really attack and try and put pressure on him. I know this is like the first possession on offense within the game, but. Uh, I saw that way too much last night, man. Just way too much. It was it was absurd, especially to start a game. Yeah, and you know, it's funny. It almost reminds me of going back to our coaching days when we were coaching the high school YMCA team, the Junior Sons team, where we, we, we were introducing some set plays for them to run, and they just go through the motions, and they I think they get so – I mean, you wouldn't expect this to be the case at the NBA level, but they go through the motions so much that they're just they're, – it's automatically in their head that they're going to make that pass, and that's exactly what it looks like. They're running a set play, and Booker's like, oh, well, at, the end, at this part in the play, I pass it here. And Westbrook isn't where – Booker thinks he should be, or I don't like, like you said, how does he not see him? And you, we, I know Booker's smart enough to not make that pass, but he did it. So I don't know what the excuse is. And then, yeah, the lack of hustle. I mean, I don't expect Booker to be, he's not the guy that's going to go get a chase down block or anything like that. But when you give up a play like that, I mean, when I give up a play like that and I'm playing, I get pissed and I'm dead sprinting to try and get it back. And I take it personally. And I'm not going to say Devin Booker doesn't have that dog in him, if you want to use that verbiage, but man, it's just, again, it's, it's tough. It's tough to see those types of plays. And that, it wasn't the only play like that that we saw. I mean, Devin Booker had a couple turnovers, at least two that I can remember off the top of my head, very similarly, where he's going in, going through the motions and, and throwing it away. And you can't, you, you just can't have that at the end of the day you gotta have better selection and especially early and even in that clip it was clear that we were starting to get beat up a little bit i just it's really it's something that again i don't think that this can be corrected in time for the playoffs and yes we do have another season with this big three where these guys are going to be together for at least another season another couple seasons who knows but these guys aren't getting any younger, man. Devin Booker is the one who we were really going to have to lean on. And he is the guy who's going to have to carry the torch for this team. Kevin Durant, I think, is going to be 36 years old next year. So Devin Booker has to be that guy. He has to be the leader. And simple, controllable mistakes like that have to be eliminated from his game. They have to. I mean, when your superstars don't perform, Chris, we've had these conversations plenty of time when they're not playing at their A game. I mean, I think I, I've said a couple of different times, if this these three aren't scoring 80 points a game, it's, it's going to be a tall task. It's going to be a tough order for this Phoenix Suns team, especially when you can't get consistency out of your guys that you brought in that need to score like I'm not even just talking about the defensive end. I'm talking about guys that need to contribute on the offensive end, like Grayson Allen, Royce O'Neal, Eric Gordon. Shit. I mean, I can't say Drew Eubanks or any of those guys because they barely get touches when they're on there. But I mean, Grayson Allen going 0 for 8 last night. It's a, it's a recipe for disaster. And you saw it. You saw it, man. And uh, my apologies once again. I'm uh, I am confused at what is going on with my PC, man. I cannot be having this many issues at this point. This bad boy is only about a year old. So I think I'm going to have to hit up my guru, Jack Miskowski. I'm going to do a little download on that. But Chris, three more games for the Phoenix Suns. And at least they get to have 
another crack at it against the Clippers tonight. And this time without literally all three of the big three for the Clippers, no Kawhi Leonard, no Paul George this time, and also no James Harden. So what are you hoping to see out of this Phoenix Suns team tonight that might give you a boost of confidence to finish out the season, man? I mean, I think one thing is for sure is that they have to come out ready to play. And I really want to see them come out and punch the Clippers in the throat. I have no delusions of thinking that they're going to do what the Clippers did to us last night to them. But it, it is funny, like when you when you talk about the landscape of the NBA and fandom, I have a coworker of mine who is a Clippers fan. He's from L.A. And and I got in this morning and I was like, Lawrence, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. And it's funny because he's like, I don't want to talk about it either. Like in his mind, and I'm sure in most Clippers fans minds, they should have won that game by 20, 30 points. And to have it be so close at the end is probably a little concerning for them. I mean, I guess I, I'd say I might feel a little bit similarly, but they still got the win. Um at the end of the day, though, the Suns need to win this game. I think, honestly, they need to win the next three, but especially tonight, just to show that they are on the same level of another playoff team and that if this were to be a series, that they would be competitive in it because that, that's the last thing I want to see. I mean, it's going to be bad enough if we end up, if if and maybe when we end up in the play-in tournament to just get bounced out in one game. But if we go in advance to get swept or even if we only win one game I think that's almost just as bad in my mind so these next three games are huge for me tonight is a must win and the next two games honestly they need to win those also 100% I mean you know Dallas shirt up that fifth spot Pelicans now have a game on the Suns at 47 and 32 Suns at 46 and 33 Sacramento right behind at 45 and 34 I mean, a watch out too, right? Like we have a game and a half up on the Lakers, but they got some easy ones to end it out. So the Suns basically control their own destiny at this point, at least to hold that top play in spot. So if you are in the play in, you get to have that game at home and it could probably be against the Sacramento Kings. So that'll be a tough test after this one against the Clippers. But all right, Chris, man, my, my computer has been just in a tumultuous state, the same as the state of Arizona right now, it seems like on multiple fronts. So with that being said, I think it's time for Reddit Reacts. What do you got for us this week? Yeah, Mike, a lot going on. And sometimes you just have to, you know, laugh through the pain. So hopefully through Reddit Reacts, we can bring some levity to the situation, have a good little laugh and pray for better days. Um, but let's start with uh, one that maybe is not not so hot. This is one I actually didn't share with you, um, kind of last minute, but I found this. And I was wondering almost, Mike, if this wasn't you posting in the Phoenix Sun subreddit, this this picture we have here, this first one is courtesy of PLW second. I don't know what PLW is, but he said, out here acting like Thanos. Looks like he's got four different sets of the book ones. I don't even recognize that one in the top right. Has that even been released, Mike? No, that has not. That is the desert colorway, I think. And that one might be the next one to come out. Um, and it's basically kind of based off of those GT Cut 2s that you have, Chris, right? The most recent ones that just went out were the Havens, which I think was on April 6th. And I don't know, maybe I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show the people something special here real quick. So hold on, Chris, I'm going to stop my camp. All right, all right. We got a we got a special special presentation from Mike. I I'll be honest. Mike texted me and asked me if I got the Havens. I didn't even see hear any announcement of the release date. I heard the rumors nope. of them. I didn't even know it was a confirmed color wave. And of course, slept right through it. So maybe I need to be more tuned in. But what you got there, Mike? What you got? <laughs> I got him. Woo! I got him right there. Hit on sneakers. I am two for three right now. Um, I'm kind of like you. I I think I slept through the denim ones. Uh, but that's okay. Two for three right now. I was really, really game planning on getting these ones no matter what because I really like playing in black shoes uh, just because, um, I don't know, it's clean. And I normally wear black socks anyways when I play. Uh, so these will be the ones that I will test out and I can give the people my honest opinions when it comes to game time in these bad boys but uh happy excited to see see what else is is going to come to i know that they've talked about those white rattlesnake ones i know a lot of people are hoping that 
you know, those special all-star games and some of his PEs have come out, unfortunately, to be the bearer of bad news. That stuff probably isn't coming out. So just make sure, Chris, you're at least following one sneaker update, you know, page on Twitter or Instagram, and, and you'll know what's happening. And we'll keep you posted. Yeah, just like we ask everyone to set their notifications for our YouTube channel, I think I got to set some notifications for these uh, sneaker release sites so I can have it going directly to my phone. And I'm not, you know, I, honestly, if I was a true fan and looking out for these, I'd be checking the apps every day. I'd be following up. And maybe maybe that's just what I need to do. I mean, some of those other color waves would be pretty cool, but I'm not getting my hopes up too much. And hopefully there's a restock of some of these other ones. I would really like to get my hands on those Havens. I do. I think that might be my favorite color wave of it as of yet. I do agree. There's nothing better than some black kick. Wait, Chris, I, I gotta, I gotta be honest. I've, I've listened back in the past. Are you saying color wave like W A V E color wave, color ways, it's tomato, tomato. <laughs> I do like color waves, though, because it's like each shoe is a different kind of like, you know, there's a different vibe to it. So I like color wave wave a little bit more than I like color wave. So keep it rolling, man. Yeah, I will. I mean, call me a wordsmith, I suppose. But we'll keep it rolling through these Reddit reacts as well. I got another one here from Reddit. And this is KD um, from earlier in the season, but was repurposed for the performance they put on last night from Leading Consequences 64 how much this team wants to win. I think this goes kind of, you know, hand in hand with what I was talking about with uh, the sentiment of the Suns fans kind of being in lockstep of like, this team just ain't getting it done, man. You know, Chris, it's a concerning thought to have at this point. And I think that some fans are justifiable. I like, you got to think about, the overall landscape of this team and the the top guys, right? Like Kevin Durant has won championships. Devin Booker has got to a finals. Bradley Beal had, was on some really bad Washington Wizards teams as well, but he's been in the playoffs. They've seen different types of success, but man, I mean, Devin Booker and Bradley Beal haven't hit that mountaintop. And to be asking yourself that question within this kind of a season where the expectations were so high is, is absolutely a cause for concern. Like I know you can't come out. It, it's an, it's a hard schedule. 82 games is a daunting task. The amount of, you know, outside work that these guys are doing and their full schedules and the practice and that kind of, it's, it, it can take a toll on some guys. So sometimes they just won't have the energy that is necessary in order to win on any given night in the NBA. But, you know, for guys who talk the talk and always say about, I mean, I just love the game. All I want to do is win to have performances like that are absolutely catastrophic. Like last night. I mean, it, it bodes the question, like, are these guys really ready to do what it takes to win on any given night? And if you're having to ask that question, um, I'm absolutely scared about just being able to turn it on for a playoffs because I, I, ju I just don't think that is an actual thing that anybody can do. I don't care how good you are. Oh, a hundred percent. And I mean, it is kind of a little bit hard to believe that there is a, any player in the NBA that doesn't have a desire to win. I mean, you don't get to the highest level in basketball by half-assing it. I know these guys work hard, but for the fans to even be questioning that is a concern. I mean, we can excuse a couple bad nights, but when you're consistently, you know, on and off, on and off, this team has been, and KD in particular, it's concerning. And people are going to start to ask those questions, whether it's fair or not. But Mike, let's keep it pushing. Let's bring some more levity. Let's let's get off the Suns for a second. Let's let's maybe move into a different lane here. We did talk about the Final Four in the beginning of this stream, and uh, this is from X.com actually. Grayson Allen enjoyer Zach Eady when his matchup isn't a clumsy six eight psychology major. <laughs> Looks like he turns into Taco Falls. Oh, uh, Taco! Is, is that fair? Is who's that more unfair to Eady or Falls? Uh, I mean, it's. It falls catching a stray, but I think it's unfair to Zach Eady because we don't know what he is yet when it comes down to what kind of an NBA prospect that he's truly going to be. 
I, I will say when I was watching that national championship, he had an incredible game, right? 37 points, 10 rebounds, like we already talked about. Uh, he's an imposing presence from his app, his size. Uh, I'm just, I, I don't know, man. I don't know if his speed is going to be able to translate to the NBA game to be a true contributor. Like, you're looking at probably like a Boban Marjanovic kind of situation. Like he could be in the league for a long time because of his name and notoriety, but I don't know how much he's truly going to play. Now, obviously he's going to get some opportunities. He'll probably go high within the draft, top 10 at least, something like that. But I don't know if it translates, man. I, I honestly do not. But yeah, I think. I think it's more of a shot towards Zach Eady just because Taco Fall, yeah, we know what he was in the NBA. He's just not an NBA player, cal- uh, caliber player. So, <laughs> no, no. And for a lot of guys, I mean, the Victor Wembanyamas are few and far between. That guy plays with so much finesse. And Zach Eady's game looks a little bit rigid. And yeah, I just wonder like, Taco Fall struggled to get up and down the court and play significant minutes in the NBA. And I think Marjanovic as well. I think that's going to be, a, you know, a concern that a lot of these scouts are looking at when you're when you're talking about drafting this guy. Yeah, is he a big body you can put in there and in situations to maybe hold down the paint, grab a, a handful of rebounds? Sure, but at, from a, what, from a scoring perspective, he does look a little bit rigid. Not really a crazy ball handler. So I, I unfortunately for maybe Edie and for Falls, I don't think it's an unfair comparison, and probably just isn't isn't that NBA level guy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you also have to think about who are the most successful bigs in this league now, too, Chris. Like, the game has absolutely changed to where if you can't play inside and out, you're not going to be a game changer. Like, I don't think Zach Eady has an outside game whatsoever. Like you said, he can't dribble the basketball. No. Like, did you see Victor Wimpenyama's freaking uh, shimmy into the spin the other night? I did, did yeah. Shim- like, dude, are you are you absolutely serious? Like there is absolutely no way that a player that size should be able to do that, but he's one of a kind. He's a freak of nature and he's going to be the face of this league for years to come. So Zach Eady just isn't that kind of kind of guy. Uh, you know, he, he'll might get, he might get 10 minutes here or there, be a nice backup center for a couple of years, but he just won't be any kind of difference maker. And honestly, man, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's the exact same thing like you're saying, like Taco Fall maybe gets four or five seasons and then is kind of re- relegated to the G League or has to go overseas. But I'm sure he'll still be able to make some kind of like NIL similar money, it, <laughs> whatever he's done playing and go back to Purdue because they love him over there. That's for sure. Yeah, and I think like Taco Fall, he'll go play overseas somewhere in, in one of those leagues, maybe Australia, who knows. He'll, he'll be playing basketball. I just don't know if it'll be at the NBA level. And just since we're talking about Wembenyama and just how impressive he is and, and has been, I think from the beginning of the season and when he was drafted, there were a lot of, you can call them haters, preying on his downfall, saying overrated, this guy's not going to make it in the NBA. And I think he's he's silenced a lot of that noise. I think despite what Chet Holmgren's been able to do in his rookie year I think the rookie of the year is going to be Victor Wembanyama and man it's scary to think that that's that's a guy that the Suns will have to deal with and being in the Western Conference for for a long time to come but Mike got a few more here for you let me see this one uh going back to the Suns this was floating around on X to the point where Devin Booker had to respond to it there was this is just a, a screenshot of it but there was this video of an alleged NBA superstar getting a haircut, if you want to call it that. As you can see, they shaved, and they at the end, they put this uh, hair piece on. And uh, a lot of people dropping Devin Booker's name in the comments, and he had to respond say, y'all got me messed up. And he's laughing out loud about it. Is this Devin Booker? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it could, damn well could be. I don't know. Have we done the research to see if he has a, a earring in his left ear? I think that guy only had one in his left ear. Oh, okay. um, so I haven't done the research. But the way that the fade was done, it was absolutely spot on. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. But I do know a lot of other people were saying Jason Tatum as well. Uh, but hey, man, you know, <laughs> I guess like – the. the it doesn't matter. Like it looks clean. It it looks like it's your full hair. So if if that's what you got to do, 
go for it. Like it doesn't yeah. matter, but it's funny that book that so many people were attaching his name to it that he had to come out and make a statement basically and say, yo, no, y'all like I still got my real hair right now. And it's, it's funny. Cause like Booker isn't like the most active guy on social media. So the point where he, he noticed it, someone, pro- I'm sure he got some text messages like, yo, you seen this. I think the the Tatum theory is also pretty funny. I, looking at it though, I mean the facial hair. I think Devin Booker usually keeps his facial hair a little more well groomed than than whoever this happens to be. But it, I think we all know one thing for sure: it's not LeBron James or Kevin Durant. We know that it's not either of those guys. <laughs> you sure it's not Kevin Durant? Oh, dude, that's that's so funny, man. I was watching a game last week too, and he was at the free throw line, and he was turning around. And it's it's so like. It's so spotty. <laughs> like it's it's almost like the grass that I got back here in my rented house. Uh, man, it needs some work. But hey, it's the it is what it is for the people. You you're comfortable in your own body, man. Just do you, KD. Just focus on basketball. That's all I care about. Right. I mean, so Mike. I guess I got to ask you, maybe because along these lines, I've heard guys, I think it was back, I don't know if the show's still going, but on ESPN, Jalen and Jacoby, I'm pretty sure I've heard uh, Bomani Jones and guys like that mention that, you know, kind of when your hair starts getting thin like that, you just got to come home, you got to do the clean, the clean yeah. cut, just, just get it over with. Do you think KD should adopt that? Or, you know, like, I guess you kind of already might well, answered that, like, let him do him, right? If he's confident with it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still under the, you know, impression and do you, the only person that has to, you know, live with your decisions or how you feel about yourself at the end of the day is yourself. So whatever makes you happy, that doesn't matter. But I'm pretty sure KD did go like he scalped it back at one point. I don't know if it was a few seasons ago, like he's done it before. Uh, Some people look good with the full cut, man. Uh, Some, it just doesn't work for them. So they kind of keep what they have and try to patch it together as best they can. But I think KD would be fine if he, you know, cut it all the way back. He would, he would look clean. Uh, it would, sh- it would shorten his head down a little bit. I feel like if I remember correctly, um, but he's always kind of looked like an alien too. He's like Wembenyama. Right, so right. It's, uh, <laughs> just stick with it, man. Yeah, I'm, I know for myself, I'm certainly one of those guys that can't pull off the bald look. I, I fucked up a haircut once, had to buzz it, did not look good. So I'm going to hold on to these these hairs that I still have in my head as long as I can. As long as you can. There you go. Uh, Mike, we got one more here. And uh, we just sometimes you have to laugh through the pain and bring some levity to a very serious situation. And there's there's nothing funny about this situation whatsoever. Uh, the news that came out today, I think KTAR or um, Arizona Sports 98.7 were the ones who broke the story. But notorious Suns fan, Mr. Orange, made headlines earlier in the year saying he was no longer going to wear the orange paint on his body. He was still going to wear all orange and be at the games. Always gets a spot, always gets camera time. And the news broke that he is involved in a scandal, if you want to call it that, or he's been arrested and charged with uh, crimes against children uh, to keep it as, as appropriate as possible for the Internet. Uh, hope he goes away for a long time. Um, I hope we never see him at a Suns game again. Uh, it's pretty terrible, but the internet was quick to react to this and, and maybe try and laugh through the pain a little bit. And so we got our last uh, outlet point guard. Uh, you know, at least he can still go by Mr. Orange while he's hopefully serving a life sentence in prison, never seeing the light of day again. I mean, Mike, I'm kind of at a loss for words here. So I'll, if you got anything to say, I'll let you take the floor here. Yeah, I mean, obviously... You know, kind of when we were leading into the show, we talked about how it has been a tumultuous 24 hours. This is part of it, right? This is an absolutely disgusting story that has come across our page for somebody who has been a face for the fan base for a number of years, you know, going through those time frames when we were really bad. If you were a Suns fan who would go to those games, you could always at least count on seeing Mr. Orange there. It's just absolutely horrible, Chris, unacceptable. I, I can't echo more of what you said i'm with you in that kind of sentiment as well it's just absolutely disgusting too that there was um i I think one of the teachers as well that was kind of miss 
or hiding information or giving him tips that you know police were searching for him as well and i think we saw his mug shots and he was going to the fucking game yesterday like he got arrested in his garb like so not only is this guy in trouble for soliciting photos for minors he, no, he knows that they're the police are looking for him and he still makes the conscious decision to go to the sun's game like just absolutely wild just disgusting absolutely unacceptable can't really say anything either than that but it would be remiss once again if we didn't at least touch on this situation because it is part of our, the team that we love the phoenix suns this is a big big situation that happened today so we had to talk about it i hate talking about it we should never really talk about this kind of stuff I'm not surprised that it was Zinn Varlock that do, did this picture because he's kind of that kind of guy on Twitter. But laugh through the pain, man. And it's – I don't know about you, Chris. I'm almost at the point where I'm like, I'm ready for this damn season to be over. Like, it it needs to be off season. We need a breather. I need a break from the yeah. Phoenix Suns team, man. Like, that's where I'm at in my mental state because – it's just been more negatives this year than any kind of positives, unfortunately. Yeah, it's just coming off the like you said, like the twenty four hours, man. I mean, the the game almost doesn't even matter at the, at a point when you when you have a story like this come out. And I think not not to I don't want to talk about it too much, but the last thing I'll say is just what I think what makes it particularly more horrible and horrific than it already is is and i didn't realize this that this guy was a high school teacher and basketball coach so if kids aren't even safe at school man like where are they safe? it's just it's terrible all around and maybe we should maybe we should have gone out on a little bit of a higher note but i didn't want to start with that and maybe you know have a have a depressed tone the rest of the way through. well we can throw some other we can throw some other negatives out there i guess to get off of the absolute worst negative in that but um terrell suggs got arrested today right <laughs> um for what was it battery assault, assault charge, or something, something like that. that yeah uh the coyotes are possibly you know moving to utah like it's just <laughs> Please, somebody, I need a, I need an ice cold beer after this one, man. I need to just recom, reset, and see where we go from here because, man, it's been a tough one. And I, I, I don't want to get political on here as well. There was also some legislative uh, items that were passed in Arizona, which are pretty crazy. Um, it's a tough, t it's a tough time here in the state of Arizona as a whole, and. I'm hoping that the Phoenix Suns can give us a bright spot tonight and they can get some revenge on the Los Angeles Clippers and get some momentum rolling into what I think is possibly what's going to happen, Chris, going into this play-in tournament and seeing if they can secure up that seven seed and go up against you know one of the best teams in the West, whether it be I mean, right now, the top three teams, we still don't know what's happening with that. Could be Minnesota, could be Denver, could be Oklahoma City, all teams that we have struggled with, not only this season, but with Denver, obviously last season as well. We know that. So come on, sons. Give me that energy tonight. That's what I need. But with that it. being said, Chris, I'll pass it over to you for any of your last thoughts tonight. Yeah, just my last thoughts. I you you nailed it, man. It seems like Arizona has been making the headlines for all the wrong reasons. And not just lately, man. It seems like we just continue to have bad press after bad press. And you just hope as a Valley sports fan that eventually and just a a I don't know, maybe Valley Valley resident, like, like you and I were both born and raised here. And I want to be proud of the state that I live in and that I was born in. And at a certain point, you just hope that it turns the corner and we can start to do better as a community and also as a sports town like at what point do we get to have our flowers it's just it seems like we've had teams that come on the precipice of greatness and then always come up short and now we might be one less sports team in town it sucks to see i'm, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of our feelings out on on the valley sports scene more broadly this saturday and i really look forward to that because i i know you have a lot to say i have a lot to say and VSP Tallman certainly should have plenty to say as, as he tends to. So looking forward to that guys, make sure you're following us. Mike, I'll let you, you do the outro here and, and share your last thoughts as well. Uh, yeah. I mean, just that for all of y'all who've been rolling with us, man, you know what we talk about when we say what this, 
Valley Sports Plug is all about, man. It's all about being fans together and having that dialogue. And we go through the same things as y'all. We just are, I don't know. We're, I'm just okay with putting it out there and having my thoughts and people, you know, you know, because at the end of the day, sparking a conversation is what we want because we love these teams and we want to see what your viewpoint is and we want to see how everybody's feeling. And unfortunately, it's a bad, we're in a bad spot, man. We're in a tough, tough spot with the Valley right now. And we're going to get through this together, man. So we appreciate all y'all who's rolling, rolling with us. Let's go Phoenix Suns. Let's get this thing right before we roll into the playoffs. Make sure you guys are following us at AZ underscore BSP on all socials. You know, we're doing ticket giveaways, keeping you guys informed with everything that's going on. Appreciate everybody. Make sure you like and subscribe to this video. If you're watching on playback, if you're listening on playback, we appreciate you guys. But with that being said, I'm Michael Benjamin. That's Chris Patrick. This was Pass the Outlet, episode 18. We'll see you guys next time. Peace. You're never going to catch us slipping. With the first overall pick, the Phoenix Suns select. Three, two, three.